The Bible says we are to bless the Lord at all times. As a church, we have the unique opportunity to celebrate His name together as well as make much of who He is. Now, Church at Crossway today will look a little bit different than it has in weeks past. We figured since you were at home in your living rooms, we would do the same. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord, and let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. So like I said, I'm here in my home, and in a few moments you'll have the unique opportunity to be led in worship by Ray and Marie Ramos, two wonderful leaders in our church, as well as in our community, from their home right to yours. Let's magnify the Lord together this morning.
you're here worshiping with us this morning. We'd love for you to interact with us in a couple of different ways this morning. We'd love for you to comment in the chat on the right of your screen and let us know that you were here. Also, we'd love to encourage you to check in on Facebook, which is an opportunity for you to be able to invite friends and family to join us each Sunday. Another way that we'd love you to interact is if you're new or if you have some new information for us here at Crossway, you can click on the digital connect card at the top right of your screen and you can give us a little bit of information. We'd love to know you were here. We'd love to connect with you during the week. Later in our service, we're gonna be taking communion together. So we'd love to just give you this opportunity now to go and grab some elements for the communion, something to drink, something to eat, so that we can partake together after our sermon this morning. As we prepare for God's word this morning, would you pray with me? Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather in so many separate places, but together in one spirit. We're so thankful for the hope that we have in you, even in uncertain times. And we thank you so much for the word uh, that is going to come to us to encourage us, to lift us up. And I thank you for each and every person who's logged on today. It's your name we pray. Amen. 
Well, hey, Crossway family and friends and anybody watching this here today. My name is Dave. I serve as one of the pastors here at Crossway, and it's my great privilege and honor to welcome each and every one of you to the conversation we get to have with a very special guest, Pastor Gordon McDonald. Gordon is a best-selling author. He has most recently been the chancellor of Denver Seminary, where I went to school and first met Gordon. He's been a presidential advisor, a uh, very prolific writer, uh, and many different aspects of the Christian faith. And maybe above all, at the top of his CV, I'm guessing, is he was a guest here at Crossway last summer, where he gave a powerful talk about some of the 13 questions that help us live deepening lives. So uh, wherever you're at, would you just uh, make a big welcome here for Pastor Gordon McDonald. Gordon, it's great to be with you here today. Thank you, David. It's good to be here. And I, as I was kidding ahead of time, I think that was the greatest 13-point sermon I ever heard in my life when you were here last summer. <laughs> you mustn't ever tell anybody that you know I did that. <laughs> Uh, I'll try and keep it as quiet as I can uh, at this, at this point. On. <laughs> and I want to wish you a belated happy birthday last Monday. Uh, turned 81 years old, and that's just uh, remarkable. And so I hope it's been a good start to the your 81st year. And I'll never forget when, I think it was back in 09, when you were the interim president of Denver Seminary, when I was a student there, you challenged us to make every year the best year of your life yet. And for a lot of us, we have this kind of maybe mistaken notion, as I'm guessing you would postulate, that often we think maybe it's when you're younger in life that's your best years, or maybe when your children are young, or maybe, maybe when you are in the prime of your career. But you believe it's possible for us to live every year as the best year of our lives. Could you just tell us just a little bit about that since you celebrated your birthday and, and maybe how you're going to approach 81 to be the best year yet? I do sincerely believe that your 60s, 70s, and 80s can be the best years of your life. Now, making a comparison like that is probably rather fruitless and trivial because every 10 years of one's life ought to be the best years, at least up to that point. My first half of life was very happy. A great marriage, wonderful children, a wonderful opportunity to be a pastor. Uh, but here I am at 80, 81, and these years are just as good. They, they have different aspects to them. But I love life, and uh, I, you know, I love my wife more than I've ever loved her before. So 81 is a good year. I can't wait for it. Can't wait for it. So, well, Just make sure you do your exercise and get your, eat the right kind of food and sleep. That's good. And I appreciate it. In a conversation I had with Gordon not that long ago, he was mentioning how for somebody my age, you need to be acting each day like you're going to be serving the Lord for the next 40 plus years. And so that's a thought I've really carried with me, at least over the last week or so, and tried to make some good decisions <laughs> in the short run. So thank you for that, Gordon. Well, as uh, we've talked before, one of the real metaphors that I think when I share time with you that resonates with me is one that comes out of uh, Mark Buchanan's book called The Rest of God. And it's about Sabbath, but he tells the story in here about uh, recovering from an unusual attitude. And I thought I'd just read a little bit of this illustration to help frame our conversation today. And I believe why Gordon being with us today will be such a gift. There's an exercise that some pilots go through late in their flight training. The student pilot gets the plane airborne at cruising altitude. Then the instructor places a loose fitting, thick woven sack over the student's head so that the student can see nothing. The instructor takes the controls and starts stunt piloting. He loops the loop. He pushes the plane, Turkish head style skyward, then flips belly up and swoops earthward. He rollicks and spirals, careens and nosedives, tailspins and wing tilts. He gets the student utterly discombobulated. Then he puts the plane in a suicide dive, plucks the bag off of the student's head and hands him the controls. His job, to get the plane back under control. As I've shared with you, Gordon, and, and times that we get to meet together one-on-one -on -one or even in group settings, some of the questions that you ask and your presence often helped me get some of the 
questions that make my life feel like it's spinning out of control, back under control, and at, and at the right cruising altitude, at the right uh, rate. And with all this disruption we've been going through over the last couple of months already now, a lot of our lives might still feel like they're in a nosedive or in a tailspin of some sort. And so I'm believing that for everyone listening today, if you feel out of sorts in any way, or maybe you're even adjusting a little bit to this new normal that we've been living through, I think the things that Gordon will have to share as we talk today will be able to help your life feel like it's under God's control because none of our lives are really under our own control. But I believe what Gordon will share will help our lives be under God's control where we can rest and trust in him moving forward. So uh, the kind of framework conversation, Gordon had quite an experience uh, during being under quarantine himself uh, in Germany uh, last month. And not only so, uh, or a couple months ago now, uh, but not only so, he's got a great word from the scriptures to share with us. And so I'll be asking him to just open God's word for us. And then we'll dialogue back and forth about how each of us can learn to live as fully and faithfully and intentionally as we possibly can during this time. So Gordon, uh, it wasn't that long ago that boy, we were earnestly praying for you as you were excited to speak at a great conference uh, at the Global Leadership Summit in Germany, and then things really changed dramatically for you. Could you tell us a little bit about that story and your experience here during the coronavirus uh, crisis? Thanks for asking me to do that, David. Uh, back in the uh, latter days of January, there was a conference scheduled to be held in Karlsruhe, Germany. Um, 10 to 12,000 people were registered. It's an every other year conference on leadership that the German Christian Church holds. I've had the privilege of speaking for any number of those conferences over the years, and this was one of those years just like that. Um, we had a speaker's dinner on a Wednesday night. And uh, then we all went back to the hotel, got a good night's sleep, and the conference started the next morning. Along around 11 o'clock in that morning, I was sitting in the center of the auditorium or the arena. Um, a man came out of the dark, and he grabbed me by the arm, and he said, would you please follow me? And uh, I, it was kind of scary. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, I'll tell you uh, at a more appropriate moment. Please follow me. And uh, at first I resisted and my minder, as they call them in Europe, my minder said, go with him, Gordon, I know him. Mm -hmm. So I followed and we left the arena and the 10,000 people sitting there. And uh, he took me to a room and in that room were about, oh, 20, 25 other people who were leaders and speakers. And we were left there um, on our own for an hour. No one told us why we were there. And finally, the head of security came in. He said, uh, there was a man in the building last night who was tested uh, positive for the virus. And you are all now under quarantine. Uh, those of you who are Germans, please leave the room immediately, get in your car and go home, and your local health authorities will contact you. Then he turned to us Americans and he said, I'm sorry to tell you that you're going to have to spend two weeks here in Germany under quarantine with no exposure to anybody. Mm. That was scary. I mean, that was really scary. And in that moment, the conference had been totally canceled. People were pouring out the doors. Two years of hard work and preparation on the part of everybody just was gone in that, act, that minute. My German publisher was there. I've known him for about 25, 30 years, and he came over to where I was standing. He said, Gordon, uh, my wife Crystal and I are going to take you to our home, and uh, you're going to do your quarantine at our, our home. Mm -hmm. So we spent seven hours driving through the German countryside at 130 miles an hour. That's the way the Germans drive. Got to their home around midnight. Uh, I had to call my wife, Gail, and face her with the fact that I wouldn't be home for a minimum of two weeks. It was a scary night to, you know, all these unexpected things. So for the next two weeks, I had to check in with the health authorities every day, have my temperature taken twice a day. They did a test on me and found that uh, I was negative. I had no problems. Nevertheless, it took 14 days to find that out. Wow. 
Finally, at the end of the 14 days, they said, you can go back to America now if you can get a plane ticket. And the, the Willow Creek people found a ticket. But in order to get to the airport, I had to be driven 70 miles down the Autobahn to Bremen, then a seven hour train ride, uh, stay overnight at the airport, yeah. hear President Trump at four in the morning say, nobody's going anywhere after tomorrow. You can't get back to the country getting dressed in about four minutes, racing over to Terminal 1 in Frankfurt. Some of you have been there. Uh, being the second person that morning through the passport control, waiting two or three more hours, terrified that they were going to cancel the flight. Finally, the plane leaves the ground, and we land in Boston seven hours later. Wow. I've given you just the outline of the story, but all the way along, there were these little internal crises to the trip. Um, places where I could have gotten lost, a place where the train broke down, uh, a place where they didn't have my hotel reservation. It was just one frustrating thing after the other. But you know, one of the interesting things was that in every one of these little crises along the trip, somebody always came out of the dark, as it were, mm. and offered the help that I needed. Directions, pointing out where I needed to go, what I shouldn't do. Yeah. It was amazing how every time I needed help, there was someone there volunteering their presence. When I got home and uh, Gail and I, after we'd had a, several hugs, I said to her, this is one of the most unusual trips I've ever taken. I, I don't know how to say this, but I have never experienced in my life the constant presence of God through prayer and answers to prayer. It, it was amazing. And uh, I could only think, this is a supernatural experience. And you, you don't get to have these very often uh, in your lifetime. And then it occurred to me that these interesting men and women who had come out of the dark to help me, you know what they may have been? How about that they were angels? Uh, I began to do just a short Bible study, which I'd never done before, even as a preacher. Hmm. I began to study the angels in heaven discovered that there's 273 references to these strange, mysterious, heavenly creatures. They're called ministering servants. Yeah. Uh, and in another place, make sure that uh, you haven't entertained some angels without knowing it. And I turned to Gail that day and I said, do you suppose that what I was escorted all over Germany with was by Jesus's angels? Um, it was an interesting speculation, which I've never really thought about before. Yeah. But there had to be angels all along the way, David, because that was a, uh, an amazing series of answers to prayer to get me home just at the very last moment when I could have spent several more weeks in Europe waiting for another way to get there. Wow. Well, praise God. We're glad you got home safely <laughs> and made it. There was a lot of us that were sure praying for you and nervous for that, but... Wow. So how, maybe is there, how has that impacted your walk with God since then of just knowing in the midst of all the, the chaos and some of the uncertainties that boy, God, God provides that he's with us, that he is even sending his German angels uh, to, to minister to you. Well, I think first of all, it, it, it re-energizes you to realize that you're, you're living a trust all a life of trust all the way. Yeah. Um, you would think an 80, 81-year-old Christian man uh, would have solved all those issues. But, you know, that was a scary trip. Yeah. Um, I, I've traveled all my life. I've put thousands of miles on airplanes every year. You have, too. Uh, but when you reach the age of 80, things don't come as easily as they used to. You're You're concerned about your health. You're concerned about... You could fall and hurt yourself and end up in a foreign hospital without in the insurance that you need. There's just a lot of things that can go wrong. You can, you can take the wrong turn, miss a, a, a train or miss a plane. All sorts of things can go wrong. And I found myself um, really a lot more frightened this time than in the past. And it, it taught me a serious lesson that... Uh, when you reach these upper ages, maybe your need to have the habit of trusting God's leadership and his angels 
Uh, maybe that's more important than ever. And during the time that I was on the road, I kept turning in my Bible to a passage of scripture, which really has guided me almost all the way through my adult Christian life. Uh, a quick background as to how it started, and you would be interested in this. I was in the same seminary you were in, but I was in seminary when President Kennedy died. Wow. And I remember the president of the seminary, Dr. Grounds, calling the student body together the, the morning after President Kennedy had, uh, had been killed. And he said, I want to read the Bible to you. And he opened the text of scripture to one that I had barely ever appreciated before. Isaiah in the Older Testament, chapter 6. Mm. It starts out this way. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His robe filled the temple, and there was smoke at the doorknobs. And around him were angels talking to one another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Those are amazing words. And when Dr. Grounds read them to us, we knew exactly what he was meaning because in effect, the king had died. And the question was in that moment, what's next? What are you trusting? What's going to happen? Are we vulnerable? And from that point forward, and now we're talking 30, oh, we're talking 45 years. Almost every time I have faced a, a moment of destabilization, mm -hmm. some scary experience, I have opened my Bible and I've gone back to that text of scripture and read that and what follows beyond it. I think it's an amazing chapter. It really opens up with the death of one of Israel's greatest kings. He was king on the throne of Jerusalem for 54 years. His name was Uzziah. He came to the throne at the age of 16. He was a very successful leader. He reorganized the city, rebuilt its walls. He rebuilt the army and the military processes. He rebuilt the economy. He fought off the enemies of Israel over those years. He probably should have gone down as one of the greatest kings that Israel ever had. But the fact of the matter is that he didn't. He failed, failed miserably. During the early years, God equipped him to be the strong leader he was. He had a deep spiritual life. I think every one of us would have given anything to come under the reign of a king like Uzziah. But there came a day, and I'm only speculating, when he got bored. Hmm. When he'd done everything there was to do, and he was looking for something new. And the only thing he could think of to do was to... Um, go into the temple, and play priest for a day. And that was one of the worst things, worst decisions or choices he could have ever made. Well, I want to shorten this story. Suddenly, this king who had been blessed so deeply by God in his first half of life was punished by God in his second half. He became a leper, and he died in disgrace. Now, all of that is background to this book of Isaiah. And this man, Isaiah, don't confuse the two names. They sound very close uh, to each other. But Isaiah must have loved Uzziah. And when Uzziah failed and he died, for Isaiah, it was a moment of total disorientation. Now you can connect that to my Germany experience because I, I don't want to stretch the truth, but I do want to try to connect the two and say, as Isaiah was disoriented, so was I feeling the pangs of disorientation. Was God going to come into that moment and help? And in Isaiah's experience, Isaiah says, in that moment when the word got out that Uzziah was gone, that he was dead, my question was, what do I do now? Hmm. And he went through a fresh new experience of meeting the Lord face to face. I hope a lot of people at Crossways will go home and read this text later in the day because it's so powerful and it describes to us what happens when a person wants to reorient their lives around the God of Israel and find the kind of refreshment and courage which 
is needed in Isaiah's day and certainly is needed in our day. In the text of scripture, the first thing we read about is the glory of God, those angels having a worship service, the amazing display of power and glory uh, that has seen as Isaiah looks into the temple and he sees this worship service going on. And in that moment, he realizes that he's been putting too much trust in Uzziah, the king, and not a trust in the king of Israel, the everlasting God. That's something I think our Christian community needs to keep reinvigorating, re-energizing in itself all the time. Under what conditions do I enter the presence of God and have a reprise, a, a, a new experience of the powerful splendor of this beautiful God of heaven and earth who has made all things and under whose control all things exist. It's the kind of thing that one brings to a worshiper service on Sunday morning. Lord, show us your glory. Refresh us in your holy presence. And that's what Isaiah did that day. He refreshed himself in the presence of God. Now, a second thing happens in that text, because the minute Isaiah has taken in a fresh view of the greatness of the Lord God, he then takes a look for the first time at himself. He looks outward, and then he looks inward. And this is what he says. This, this is the word of a prophet. Woe is me, I said, for my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. What's he doing there? He's taking a hard look at himself and recognizing that on any given day of the week, it's easy to stray away, yeah. to lose one's trust, to lose one's effectiveness of faith. Isaiah has to go before the Lord and confess himself to be a sinner. Those two things go together. The first thing, I behold the glory of the Lord. The second, I see the darkness that so easily comes about in myself. So Isaiah has a moment of humility where he confesses his sin to God and asks for a renewal and a cleansing of his heart. Two important things which I must do every time I worship, recognize God's glory, recognize my own propensity to sinfulness. The third thing that happens in that chapter, as it goes along with the story, he says, then an angel went to an altar, presumably an altar in heaven, and he picked up a glowing coal, and he came toward me, and he put the coal on my lips. Now, that's strange language. Why don't the lips get burned? But the fact is that they don't, because the coal stands for purity, a renewal, and the, and the angel says to Isaiah, this coal has touched your lips. You are shown mercy. You are forgiven. That's the third thing I need when I come before the Lord in a worship service, be it a church, in my home, or some other place. I must see the glory of God. I must see the darkness of myself. I must see what happens at the cross when God approaches me mercifully, gives me grace. I could spend the whole day telling you about times in my past where in a moment of brokenness, I needed the same thing that Isaiah received from the angel who came toward him. On a regular basis, I need to know a fresh view of the grace of God. Mm to be able to enter into worship, experience his forgiveness for my sins, and then to leave to go back out into the larger world, knowing that the grace and the mercy of God is upon me. There's a fourth thing in this text, David, sure. because then Isaiah says, having been given this moment of grace from the angel at the altar, then Isaiah says, I heard the voice of the Lord. Interesting. That doesn't happen up until about the seventh or eighth verse in the chapter. Certain things have to happen before I can hear God speak into my life in a very personal way. 
I do have to have this glorious experience. I do have to have this need of confession. I do need to have this experience of forgiveness. And then I hear the voice of God. And what might that voice say when I listen to it carefully? It might say, it's time for you to listen and to be prepared to go where I will send you. Mm. A missionary loves a verse like that because it's a very missionary-like verse. But it's a verse that's relevant to every one of us who are in worship today. I come to a service of worship, whether the crowd is 10 people or 10,000. And one of my ultimate objectives is to hear God speak. Not just to speak to the crowd of people, but to speak to me, to Mm. speak to you. I guess I would believe that the God of the Bible has something to say to us every time we stand before him or kneel before him. Mm. And we ask for his grace and mercy. He then turns around and says to us, I have something to say to you. Mm. And if we are willing to say, speak, Lord, then the last thing in this chapter that becomes relevant, because the Lord then says, I will, who will go, who will send, I send, and Isaiah will speak out and say, here am I, send me. That's a very powerful thought. Absolutely. And that's a thought that ought to be in the depths of the heart of every one of us who calls ourselves a biblical person or a Christian person. We have a God who speaks to us in small ways, in larger ways. We have a God who loves us so much that he privileges us with a message of sending. He has things for us to do in this period of the viral epidemic. He has people for us to go to, things to give, ways to serve, encouragement to offer. And the God of heaven and earth is sending each one of us out in different directions to do different things, which expand the dimensions of his kingdom. Down through the years of my life, I've experienced that pattern on a few occasions, not because I was the best person in the room, but simply because I've won, like many who are listening to you and me today, have asked themselves, how can God use me? Some of us are used to do great and mighty things. Others of us do hidden things, quiet things. When you get to be 81, you don't do that many big things anymore, you, but you're obedient on a regular basis, and you find all sorts of ways each day that God may want to use you and send you. One of the great memories of my life came back, what is it, 20, 25 years ago now, when ground zero blew up and the planes hit the trades tower. I was driving in my car when the news came over the radio that uh, something terrible had happened. And by the time I got home, I knew something of the story. I knew that New York was bleeding by this plane crash. And it was, as, as, it was almost as if God said to me, you have a place to go today. I want you at ground zero. I want you and Gail down there. Wow. I called a friend of mine who was up in the Salvation Army in the New York City area, and I told him, I said, Do you, would you need anybody like Gail and me? He said, how soon can you get here? Mm. 24 hours later, we were deep in the rubble where the planes had hit those towers and the towers had come down. Gail was leading a small first aid station, and I was in on my hands and knees with the firemen and the police looking for body parts and listening for the cries of any survivors deep in the rubble that were caused that day. It was an incredible week. I will never forget it, David, first of all, because none of us knew whether we were ever going to get out of that place. They were telling us every day that it was possible that the buildings on either side might tumble too. And if they did, there'd be no way out. They were telling us that the air might pollute, be polluted with all kinds of uh, chemicals that uh, when let free in the process, people might die. You know something? None of us cared. 
It was if, if we die, we die. If that building falls, let it fall. If that air is polluted, let it be polluted. We're not leaving. And every once in a while, I'd go over 100 yards away to where Gail was, and we'd go off in a little alley and put our arms around each other and hug one another tightly, and we would promise each other, if something happens bad here, we're not running. This is where we will live the rest of our lives. I've never forgotten those days because it made me realize that that's probably the way where some of the great men and women saints of church history That's the way they felt. I'm not going anywhere. My life is pinned to this, whatever is needed to be done. It's the way I felt when I heard God say, who shall go for us? Whom shall I send? And I was only too glad that day along with Gail to say, here we are, send us. So I go back to those days in Germany. Uh, They were scary days. I'm not sure I want to repeat them. But I do know with some degree of confidence that I was walking in God's direction and that here and there along the way, some of those wonderful angels from heaven were taking their way and giving me the directions I needed. So I'm here today for one more exciting day, the best day of my life. Mm. Wow. That's powerful, Gordon. Thank you so much for opening God's word and opening your heart and your story, uh, many stories there to us as well. So I think for a lot of us, as I hear this Isaiah text and even think of kind of the extraordinary experience of not only being in Germany, but being there at Ground Zero, uh, I kind of feel pretty ordinary. You know, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in my house and I don't have these real heavenly like experiences with angels and you know I feel like my kids who are normally are acting like angels or maybe acting like the converse of angels which we won't mention and and so I would love an experience of glory I would love some kind of big mission that I could sink myself into but this life feels so stuck so trapped um, so on hold what might you encourage some of us? It could be, we're, maybe we're tired. It could be, we're just going through the motions, you know. Now, how do we, how does this kind of extraordinary experience really translate to the ordinary moments that a lot of us who are listening today are just kind of going through? How do we connect with God? How do we serve Him? Um, how do we take hope and comfort and continue to trust Him and just the mundane and the ordinary and some of the uncertainty of all this? Well, first of all, I want to say to you, you live anything but an ordinary life. And you got 45 more years to really turn up the heat. And I expect great things from you. You're you're becoming a leader all over New Hampshire ever ever since you got here. And it's more than New Hampshire. It's New England, Dave. And God is using you in some powerful ways. So don't forget, I didn't warn you. I'll pay you a few bucks after this here for that. Thank you. (laughs) You know, the essence of the Christian gospel begins with Christ, of course, at the cross and the empty tomb. But for those of us who have answered his call and followed him, our first general challenge all together is to walk through the world every day, spreading the radiance of Jesus. Yes. It begins with the way we greet ordinary people in our pathway. The person who serves a meal at a restaurant checks out our groceries at the supermarket, gives us directions at the post office, and and a thousand other things. The way we treat them with dignity, with encouragement. You don't always have to be talking religious terms to be the presence of Christ in various places. And it's one thing I, I hope will come out of this time is that the Christian community will recognize that as it walks through the larger world each day, it's sprinkling the gestures of Christ in every direction. The glad hand, the encouraging remark. But beyond that, then there's secondly, uh, every one of us, the Bible says, has given some particular gift or sense of calling or vocation. Uh, Some of us may be privileged to have more than one gift or capacity. But I think it's very important in a time like this for Christian people to take a new examination of themselves and say, 
what is it that God has uniquely given to me to contribute to this destabilization that we're going through right now? What do I have to offer? Um, and uh, we may find a dozen different possibilities in something like that. But we ought to be challenging each other to make sure uh, that the church makes its presence known, this people of God. Uh, one of the things I've noticed in, in the media, and uh, I guess it's just the way things go, you hear a lot about the scientists. And I'm very thankful for every one of those men and women who've got their science down. Uh, they're saving our lives. Yeah. I'd like to hear more about people of faith mm. who are scientists and who are not necessarily scientists. I'd like to hear the larger world saying, those people who call themselves followers of Christ, we couldn't get along without them. Mm. And um, that's happened before. It needs to happen as much as possible now. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I love, as you were talking, I'm reminded of Mother Teresa's great quote that said, no one can do great things, only small things with great love. That's a beautiful statement. Yeah, it sure is. And how can we just do our creative best to do some small thing in love each and every day? And you also reminded me of uh, one of the C.S. Lewis quotes where he said, you've never met a mere mortal uh, when you encounter the faces of human beings. You know, this is, this is from his Weight of the Glo uh, Glory essay, um, butchering his beautiful uh, prose, but that's the idea that none of us are ever talking to mere mortals, including the people under our very roof. And as we think about that, it's really come to my attention a lot of just some of the difficulty I think families are having right now, marriages are going through right now. There's maybe been some tension and perhaps getting out has been the escape for what's maybe felt like um, a prison sentence of some kind. And now that we're sheltering in place and quarantined, there's really a hard place. There's, it's hard to escape. And now things are being exasperated quite a bit. And maybe in light of this passage and just from your reflections, what hope or counsel or guidance just might you give some of those uh, out there, some of us who are they're just struggling in some ways and really, really in need of some hope and some, and some help now? I don't want to respond to what you're saying, David, sounding like a gloomy or pessimistic person. Sure. But I have a fear that we need to know, or let me say that again. I'm convinced we need to know the next weeks are likely to be more difficult. Um, I have a relationship with someone who's done a lot of studying on the human brain. And he tells me that as the weeks go by, um, life is going, to dis is going to become tangled for a lot of people. And um, we're going to have to use more of our brain power to live in unprecedented situations. Mm. And the habits we've developed in life they kind of get set aside during this period of time. So the, the next weeks could get tougher for a lot of people who don't prepare themselves for it. In the home, in a marriage, for example, it's an important time to recognize that I'm called upon to serve my spouse, yes. uh, to come alongside of them and to make sure that I'm pouring all of my energy and all of my encouraging force into the person that God called me to in a marriage relationship. Uh, th that, that notion of serving is so very important. It, and beyond it, the ability to say things like, thank you, I'm sorry, yeah. what can I do to help? Are key communicative lines that keep relationships between husbands and wives renewed. They also help a lot in keeping my relationship to my children. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not wrong for a father to say to his children at some points, dad was wrong. I want you to forgive me. Yeah. So that, that begins as my deep concern that our homes would be places of renewal in this time of relationship, yeah. time for conversation, time to get to know each other in a new way. But to begin with the question, how do I serve? Yeah, um, really good. 
Just, just a, a, a scripture. Husbands or wives, love your spouse as Christ loved the church. Mm. How did he do it? He died for the church. Yeah. And um, I remember as a young man saying, I guess God says I've got to die for Gail. If I'm going to die for her, I'm going to treat her with a lot of respect and affection. Believe me. Hmm. Hmm. Well said. Yes, yeah, I think about Isaiah kind of being undone, as he described, in the glory of God. I think this time where we're really more quarantined is really forcing us, I think, to have to confront some of the aspects of our life we we're really content to ignore and to run from by staying so busy. And now that we're in, in place like this, many of these things are rising to the surface. And I think for a lot of, a lot of couples, it's very easy to be blaming each other or blaming someone else for some of these internal things that we've been struggling through. And some of our own identity is probably getting called into question because we can't do all the things that we might like. But I love Gordon, how he just draws back to remembering who God is, his good, his goodness, his truth, his beauty, his power. And in light of that, boy, it's humbling. And it just brings us back to that same phrase, here I am, send me. And yeah, maybe send me to ground zero, but maybe send me to love a person who I'm maybe frustrated with right now. Send me to just do those menial tasks that are actually really holy tasks. And uh, like Brother Lawrence, who we love so much, who practiced the presence of God, but he did that as a dishwasher, doing some of those household chores. And somehow as he has opened himself up to the Lord, boy, the Lord met him in powerful ways. And your friend, uh, Trevor Hudson, who I've gotten to know a little bit, tells a great story of when he was meeting with, uh, in a similar situation like me and you, and, and he was supposed to go off and spend a day in silence a away. And he came back to his spiritual kind of leader or director and said, here's all the great insights that I got. I read all these books and did all these things. And, and the director says, Trevor, insight is the consolation prize encounter or experiencing God's presence is the main prize. Mm. And I just love that idea that oftentimes we don't need some new insight and some new thing, even some new book during this time, I think as you're pointing us toward, we need to make a space to encounter God's presence by being still, being slow, remembering who he is, being in his word, and then responding obediently as a result. Uh, so, well said, David. Yeah. Well, Gordon, thank you so much for taking time to be with us. And I know our church uh, was just riveted by your last talk. And I know today's message is going to really speak to so many hearts. The passage again was Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And we encourage you to really spend some time in that. But Gordon, I'd be really grateful if you would close our time by praying for us. Can I ask you to pray for us? I'd be glad to, David. And thank you. Thank you. Father, as this congregation comes to a point where formal worship has ended, I pray that there will have been something said or sung or done in the last minutes that will change each of us and draw us closer not only to Jesus, but to the desire to be more faithful servants. My prayer is for anyone who comes to church today in this strange peculiar way of being in homes and public places, that you would speak and that every, every one of us might be able to walk away saying, I heard a word from God today. Keep us safe and strong. Give us insight and wisdom how to operate in our homes and in our places of work in our neighborhood. Help us, Lord, to be faithful men and women. And give us the benefit of your benediction and your blessing out on the streets of this world as we go for the next week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
generosity to crossway at this time your partnership helps god do his work in and through us both here locally and globally your generosity is allowing us to continue our partnership with local partners such as the southern new hampshire rescue mission real options and johnny and friends it's also allowing us to champion our global partners cicm in india mohi in kenya and Enlace in el salvador we're so thankful that you continue to partner with us, and we would encourage you to continue to give online or to send in a check to 503 Main Dunstable Road in Nashua. Thanks again for your generosity. In way of announcements this week, first of all, this first announcement is for 6th through 12th grade students and their parents. Student Ministries is providing a large group experience every Sunday at 4 p.m. During this time, we can't come together in actual physical presence we're coming together in spirit and a community to connect so we'd love for you to go online if you haven't been able to connect with us yet go on to crosswaycc.org the main page and scroll down you're going to see student ministries online it's a great way to connect with others during this time second every other week crossway is providing a food drive to support one of our community partners who are doing amazing work at fighting food insecurity in our communities right now. So we would love for you to join us at our next food drive. It's gonna be Wednesday, May 6th. We're gonna be supporting the National Soup Kitchen and Shelter. 
We have two drop-off locations, the same ones that we've had previous weeks, but if you haven't been uh, following along with us and contributing to that, we'd love for you to go on also at acrosswaycc.org down to the Serving in Crisis page. Click on there. There's a whole new list. We're also going to be providing hygiene items to the shelter this time. We would love for you to join us next week. Next Sunday, we're going to be beginning a new sermon series in the book of Ephesians. As we look back at different events in our life and different parts of our faith journey, we realize that sometimes the hardest moments are the moments when we grow the most. What if we learned how to maximize those times and to recognize them early on in order to grow closer to God and to see all that he is doing in our lives? That's what Paul does in the book of Ephesians. He's writing to a church that was going through very uncertain times, very similar to what we're going through today. And he was encouraging them to take on lives of resiliency, to come alongside what God was doing and to see how he was working during those times. So we would love for you to join us in this new series that we're calling Resilient. If you do, we feel like you will come to understand the renewal and revival that God wants to create in your hearts during this uncertain time. We'd love to encourage you to read Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 4, and Ephesians 4, verse 1, in preparation. Hope to see you then. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King.